gentlemen of the jury. We're giving Miss Potter a jury trial, and in that jury trial, we're going to presume her innocence, and we're going to require the state to prove each and every element of the crimes. And in doing this, I'm going to sort of categorize here. <clears throat> I'm first going to get I'm going to get into the evidence right now. And I'm not going to give a real lengthy argument, but the first category I'm going to talk about is causation. That's the first category. Let's look at the causation in this case. And to do that, we have to look at the instructions of the jury. In the instructions, and there'll be, I got scribbling on there, but you'll get a copy of this back in the jury room, and it's extremely important. The importance is this. I'm going to read it. To cause the death, causing the death or cause the death means that the defendant's act or acts were a substantial causal factor in, factor in causing the death of Dante Wright. The defendant is criminally liable for all the consequences of her actions that occur in the ordinary and natural course of events, including those consequences brought about by one or more intervening causes, if such intervening causes were a natural result of the defendant's acts. The fact that other causes contribute to the death does not relieve the defendant of criminal liability. Here's the however, and it's extremely important, particularly when the state argues that Dante Wright had nothing to do with his death, which is absurd. This is, however, the defendant is not, Kim Potter is not criminally liable if a superseding cause caused the death. What's a superseding cause? <clears throat> is a cause that comes after the defendant's acts, alters the natural sequences of events, and this is the sole cause of a result that would not have otherwise occurred. Let's look at that superseding cause. Let's look at the evidence. Substantial factor. What happened here? We got a Sunday afternoon in, in the spring, April 11th, and and a FDO officer, my client, our client, and Mr. Lucky, Officer Lucky, were driving in their town, Brooklyn Center. They see a car that was going into a right turn but then decided to go left. They see the thing on the end windshield or whatever, and they also see that the license plate is not registered. My client did say, our client did say that she might not have even stopped them. But Lucky, Officer Lucky, who was a trainee, who she, her, she was the FTO, wanted to stop him for the thing hanging on the window and the registration. He first saw that thing on the window, and then when they got closer, they saw the registration, or they checked on it. In any event, they stopped him. That, everybody agreed that was a legal stop. They were doing their job on Sunday afternoon in Brooklyn Center. After they stopped, Lucky and my client got out of the car. Lucky went up to the door. You, you heard and you can listen to it again, hopefully, hopefully at the right uh, motion and not slow it down till forever. Do it at regular motion. He goes up there. He says, hi, bro. Something like that, very nice. <clears throat> Ask him for his insurance and driver's license. I think he tells him something about the thing hanging on the window, on the mirror. And he doesn't have a license. He doesn't have insurance. And he gives him an insurance card with somebody else's name on it. And Lucky smells marijuana and sees some in the car. Well, that's consistent because as you learned, he smoked a joint, a joint with his passenger that morning when they got up early, and I asked what time, oh, 10 o'clock in the morning was early for this couple. But they, after that, they smoked a joint. And what's even more corroborative of that is the forensic pathologist says 4-3-L, I believe it's something like that, is a high reading. So we know now that circumstantial evidence, which you'll see in the instructions, reasonable inference 
He has that kind of reading, he's stoned. He's got marijuana smell in his car. He's got seeds on the floor, shake the Lucky called it. So Lucky goes back to his car, where, and Kim Potter goes back. They go in the car and they do a warrant check, which is, that's legal, that's proper, that's their job, that's what they're supposed to do. And lo and behold, Dante Wright has a warrant, a bench warrant, in other words, he didn't show up in court for a weapons violation. As Lucky said, that raises the antennas. Oh, there might be a gun in this car. And Lucky said, and he grew up in this neighborhood, he said that two in five cars have guns in it. So that raises the antenna, antenna for these two cops. In the meantime, they called for assistance, which is regular police work. They do that even on a traffic stop. And Sergeant Johnson shows up. So we now have the three. And they're going to, they see that there's marijuana, no license, no insurance, a warrant, a bench warrant for a weapon, and a TRO or restraining order where some person, lady, accused him of harassing him. That's what we had. That's what these police had when they walked out of that car, when the two walked out, Sergeant Johnson was already right there, and they go up to the car, and everything up to this point, Kim Potter's acts, Lucky's acts, Johnson's acts are all protocol. They did everything right. And once, they, once Lucky gets up to the car, he tells, he tells Dante Wright to get out of the car. Dante hesitates, says why. I believe the evidence shows, if you listen, if it does show it, that even his passenger said, go get out of the car. But anyway, he hesitated, and he said, why? And then he got out of the car. And Officer Lucky, being a nice guy, I mean, he, he could have taken him and thrown him against the, against the car and put his knee on his neck. No, he said, put your hands behind your back. I'm going to handcuff you. And at the same time, Sergeant Johnson says, you have, and he wants to know why, you have a warrant. Now, Dante Wright realizes there's a warrant for his arrest. And he knows what it is. So, within seconds, he all of a sudden breaks away. That's the cause, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. That's what caused this whole incident. If he would have gone and with the officers, been handcuffed, go to the squad car, go take your ride downtown, and it's over. That is called, as the law states, a superseding cause caused the death. Because everything after that, the officers did, they did to try and restrain him, try and stop him from leaving. And don't listen to Stout. This Stoughton guy saying you should just wave at him and say goodbye and let him go? With a weapons bench warrant, with a temporary restraining over, he's stoned. You don't let that, that's not protecting the public, and that's not serving the public. They had to stop him. And he watched the video, and he's fighting. My client, our client, goes around, lucky, and grabs her gun instead of her taser. She thought, and I don't think there's anybody here, even the state would contest the fact she thought she had a taser. It was within seconds. You, you watch it. It was chaos. She's going around here, and Johnson, he's in the car now, holding on to the shifter and onto the key, and then he grabs Dante Wright's arm. And, you know, I, I once mentioned in this case, and I got a little giggle, I guess, from the state. I said, what would have happened if that car would have went in reverse? Oh, wouldn't go in reverse. He couldn't go in reverse because there were squad cars back there. Well, what about if it accidentally, from the park position, accidentally went down to reverse when he was struggling to get it in drive? What would have happened then? A very dangerous situation for everyone, the officers and Wright. So they're fighting. 
They're struggling, whatever you want to call it, and Wright's putting up a good struggle. He doesn't want to go to jail. So Kim Potter, I, I got the seconds, where Kim Potter comes around and she says, I'll tase you. Now, all the time before that was police work, good police work, trying to stop them from leaving. And then she comes around and tries to de-escalate, it's called, the situation by saying she'll tase him, thinking that she had her taser. Why didn't he stop? Two cops are fighting with him. There's a, another police officer that's saying he's going to tase him. He, he didn't want to go to jail. He wasn't going to listen to these police officers. Four seconds later, and you'll see this, and make it chaos, because that, don't slow motion it, make it at the right speed. She says again to de-escalate it, to say, hey, buddy, stop, I'm going to tase you. Nothing happens with him. He fights, he struggles more. Watch the video. And then a couple seconds later, I think three, four seconds, I believe, she says, taser, taser, taser. And he said, okay, stop, I give up. No, no, no. Would she have tased him if he ever said that during that, those seconds? That he was struggling, that he wanted to leave? When he said, I, I'm not going to go, I'm not going, handcuff me, I'll go to jail. No. And that's the cause. That's everything before that the police officers did as they were supposed to. In fact, it was a very procedurally right reasons for them. So the causation, do my notes here. The causation was Dante Wright. And Thing, you know, sometimes things happen that, that are unexpected, but they save a life or they save serious injury. Because when Kim Potter said, taser, 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 that's a signal for the law enforcement officers to take their hands off them, which they did. And then a second later, she shot him, tragically. But she didn't know she had a gun either. And then he said, you shot me. And being alone, what does he do? Does he stay there and say, hey, help me out? He takes off then. And you see the video, he goes like a jet. He drives in danger, he's shot, he drives in danger. He really wanted to get away. And what you can reasonably infer from that, you can reasonably infer that he knew he was guilty of that weapons violation. And he didn't want to go to jail and run the risk of a criminal case. He left to get out of there, <clears throat> unfortunately, and he was able to leave. He said, you shot me. He drove down. The forensic pathologist said he could have been alive for up to a minute. So you saw the, you heard the crash, I believe <clears throat> it was about 10 seconds that the crash happened when he took off down the road. And that... <clears throat> What's, what's really interesting here, and uh, I don't know, jurors, you're probably wondering a little bit too, but why, <clears throat> why are we watching all this stuff about the car accident? Why is that part of this case? Kim Potter didn't drive that car down there. Kim Potter didn't tell him to drive that car down there. He, on his own volition, while he was alive, drove down there. He should have stayed. Maybe he would have had some medical help from the officers Potter, Lucky, and Johnson. Think about it. Yet they show all of this. They, they show the poor ladies, the lady, Miss Lundgren, and her husbands, and, and physical health, bad physical health. They show that. They show her daughter, and it's all got nothing to do with this case. But you know why? You know why they're doing that? They're trying to run you down the rabbit hole, as she says. They want sympathy. They want sympathy. They want to blame that on our client. Think about it. How could she be at, at fault for that? He purposely decided to drive away. 
He just didn't want to go to jail. So that's the superseding cause. The judge will instruct you. As it is here, it's the last sentence. I'm not saying something that's not there. A superseding cause comes, that comes after the defendant's acts. Her acts were all legal. Everything she did was legal. And then he tries to break away. And consciously, she thought she was doing the right thing. So the state, there's only, that's an element too, by the way. I don't know if I mentioned that, but the element for this, case, for, this for both crimes is, second, the defendant caused the death of Dante Wright. Kim Potter caused the death of Dante Wright. The death of Dante Wright was caused by the defendants committing a reckless handling of a use of firearm. Cause. And that's in the same, in the second. Elements of manslaughter too. The defendant caused the death of Dante Wright. So I could stop right here because if you presume what you have to do, if you presume that she did not cause a death, which you have to do by the presumption of innocence. Did they prove beyond a reasonable doubt that she caused this death? No. Dante Wright caused his own death, unfortunately. But that's, that, those are the cold, hard facts, the evidence. So I could sit down now because they didn't prove that element, but we're going a little bit further. I apologize, it'll be a little longer. And the second, the second um, issue that I like to talk about is the authorized use of force. And the authorized use of deadly force is the first <clears throat> defense. And the, the state has to prove that they have the burden, and I'm going to read it to you. The defendant is not guilty of a crime if he used deadly force as authorized by law. This is important. To prove guilt, the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant's use of deadly force was not authorized by law. And when you look at that, you also look at the presumption of innocence. And you must presume that she had a right, authorized use of deadly force, that she had a right to do it. That's the presumption of innocence. And the state has a burden to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that she did not. And the other, <clears throat> the other interesting factor that wasn't mentioned is that this, you can't hindsight these things. You can't say to the officer, well, now, wait a minute. You, you uh, didn't spark your gun or your taser. You went to all those training sessions, so uh, you should have known it was a taser or gun, not a taser. It's not should have known. And we'll get to that. But let's first look at defendant's authorized use of deadly force. First off, we, there was a vague argument that the officers are a family. So they're lying. They're not telling the truth. They're helping Kim Potter out. They're a family. Come on. You saw all of these officers. Were they professional? Yes, they're college graduates. They came before you and told the truth. They weren't impeached by anything. A family? Major Johnson is no longer in Brooklyn Center. He's down in, I believe, Goodhue County, down in Red Wing. He's a major down there ahead of patrol. Is he the kind of guy that would lie about something? No. And the other officers? The commander? Is he part of the family? No, he knows her. He thinks he's a good cop. So to argue that these police officers gave their opinion because they wanted to protect Kim Potter. They know what the oath is. They know what a crime is. They know what perjury is. They're not going to do that. That's, a, that's, that's going down the rabbit hole, I believe. In any event, remember the, the auto accident? And there was this one picture, I believe, and Dante Wright was lying on the ground. I think there were six or seven police officers around him trying to revive him. Police officers aren't thugs. You've seen these officers. 
To say that they would color their testimony to help their friend out is outrageous. It's simply not fair. And as far as the authorized use of force, they paraded their own witnesses, the state's witnesses, Major, John, Major Johnson. I asked them, well, were you in danger? Were you, I can't remember exactly what I asked him, but basically to show that he was in grave danger or might get killed by him wrestling with Wright while leaning over the car. Maybe he wasn't in sitting in the car, but he was, he's 6'2", leaning over and grabbing that shifter and grabbing his arm. If he would have been able to get that shifter going and get it going, what would have happened to Johnson? The worst would be death if he took off like he did as a jet. The least would be serious injury. And when I asked him that, what did he say? And this wasn't contrived, it wasn't, no evidence that it was made up. He said, he quoted 60966, which is in the instructions. That on deadly force, he cited the statute. That's what he believed, that was his Take, and he was there. He wasn't in a uh, classroom or in Florida watching a video. He was there. He was the man leaning over and struggling with this guy. And when somebody, when you're taken by surprise, thinking all common sense, reasonable for when you're taken by surprise like Wright did, and you're relaxed before that, and you're doing these things, and all of a sudden he won't give up, that's chaos. That's chaos. And Johnson was in there. And Stoughton can say what he wants, but what did James say? After hearing and the testimony of Johnson, no question that Officer Potter had a right to use deadly force. Even though she didn't know she was using it, she had a right to. And that's what the law is. And they have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that she did not have a right. And what do they do? The only person they call is Stoughton, the $95,000 contract a year guy. Stoughton, who has not been a cop for, five, for 15 years, he was a police officer five years, and doesn't remember if he ever had a cross, crisis. He wanted to talk about field training. It's hard to believe our state of Minnesota would do that, would hire some guy like that, who, and you compare him against James, 40-some years as a cop, all the things he's accomplished in his life. And Stoughton, and you have a right, there's an instruction, you have a right to compare like uh, the believability. You can look at that instruction here about experts. You have a right to look at that, their bias. Is there a bias? I don't know. He gets paid, he can be paid up to 95000 Our expert, he doesn't charge. He chooses not to charge. He drove up here having a heart surgery two weeks ago. That's how strong he believes in the fact that she could use deadly force. Lucky. He also, <clears throat> he was here, he was in it. He was involved in this struggle. He said that Kim Potter isn't going to jail. She's not going to jail. That's what he said. In his opinion, Kim had a right to use deadly force. But we won't stop there. Then we have Fleslin. Garrett Fleslin, a commander, been in the Navy 10 years, 21 years as a police officer. He's the commander at Brooklyn Center. And he said, on the hypothetical I gave him, and it was a hypothetical exactly, and you can check your notes, you can remember his testimony, the same hypothetical that happened at this scene. And he said, yes, she could use deadly force in that situation. That's two of their witnesses. Then we've got Gannon. We call Gannon the chief of police, ladies and gentlemen, a man who was in the Marine Corps a man who fought in battle for our country, a man who wanted to give 
Kim Potter due process, and he got terminated for it. Think about it. He takes a stand. He gets the same hypothetical. Yes, deadly force. They have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that she did not have a right to deadly force. We've just proven through three witnesses that she did under this circumstance. Do any of those officers, Chief Gannon, he doesn't work there anymore. The major doesn't work there. The commander, he isn't too worried about his job. Are they the kind of individuals that would lie, that would give a false opinion? No. Think about it. Think, look at the, look at the inst instruction on that. But we're not done there. I have another, that there's two absolute reasons why she's not guilty, absolute. She didn't cause this, and she had a right to use deadly force. We proved it. And all we have to do is establish reasonable doubt. They have to prove it under reasonable force. But we have another one. The third reason that there's an acquittal here and not guilty is because of the statutes. And the state, the state rushed over this a little bit on the elements. Let's look at those elements a minute and let's rely on what the language, what words mean. So we go to, I'll get it. We go to first the reckless use of a firearm. <clears throat> We've already talked about the cause of death. That's one element. Quick break, back with more right after this. Welcome back. Let's get you back into the courtroom in Hennepin County, Minnesota. Earl Gray continues to deliver his closing argument. The um, next <clears throat> area, another basis for acquittal for not guilty is the simple answer, mistake. She made a mistake. The company that makes tasers recognizes that, that they, even though they do all these things to guard, guard against it, they have the police officer sign a piece of paper saying that they understand this and that. They do that so they don't get sued. But you could be trained forever, and under exigent circumstances, you can end up making a mistake. We called Dr. Miller. Dr. Miller, we didn't hear anybody saying he wasn't a professional psychologist who deals in mistakes like he did. He talked about the brain power. I'm not going into all that. Frankly, I didn't understand all of it, but I do understand this, that in the walk of life, nobody's perfect. Everybody makes mistakes. And some of those mistakes are small mistakes, but some of them are very serious. And she obviously made a mistake. She, it's called an action error. He explained that, how your, the brain, the dominant brain, uh, takes over the other brain and you draw your gun instead of your taser. You know, you, and you mentioned doctors. Doctors, I've never heard of a doctor being charged with making a mistake. And we know common sense history tells you that they've made many. And many have caused death. Many have caused serious injuries. They're doctors. Pilots. Pilots make a mistake, the plane crashes, everybody's dead. If the pilot survives, he doesn't get charged with a crime. Mistake. I suppose the lawyers make mistakes. If you make a mistake and you're under the pressure of a trial and you're defending somebody and you make a mistake, what happens? Your client ends up in prison. That's the kind of pressure you have. And, and 
you think about it, ever since man, everybody makes mistakes. Nobody's perfect, ladies and gentlemen. And this lady here made a mistake. And my gosh, a mistake is not a crime. It just isn't. Just, it just isn't in our freedom-loving country that we're going to put you in jail for a mistake you made. Even though you took all the training, even though you did everything, you made a mistake. And what does the Taser people say? Well, <clears throat> we recognize there are confusions. There are mistakes. We recognize that. Well, if they do recognize it, let me ask you a question. Why do they have the taser shaped like a gun? They have yellow on it and all that stuff, but why is it shaped like a gun? Why is it a flashlight? Why is it in a holster on their belt? Why is it in their, up here on their, by their chest? Think about it. Why? Because they can sell more of them if it's shaped like a gun in a holster. Of course, they're in marketing. They're marketing it. So, and when you <clears throat> look at that mistake that she made, you look at the character witnesses we called. And character witnesses weren't there. They've just known Kimberly Potter for many years, and they think the world of her. And they say that she's a peaceful person, not a bully. She's never been accused of a abuse of force of being a bully cop in 26 years. That's, that's a record. Believe that. She's peaceful, and she's a law-abiding person. You heard the witnesses. One witness said she was like my mother when he was a neighbor of hers. And one of the reasons that you are a good person throughout your life is when one, something like this happens. When you're falsely accused of a crime and you're innocent, you go back and you say, Oh my gosh, I've been a good person all my life. I want to get some people that know me and have them tell the jury that I'm a good person. That's one of the reasons you are a good person. You want to rely on your reputation. And on, by the way, in the, in the uh, instructions you get, there's an instruction. Character evidence. In case you've heard, <clears throat> excuse me, in case you have heard evidence as to the character of the defendant, you should consider such evidence with all the other evidence in the case in determining whether or not the prosecution has proven the defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. So our law, our jury instructions recognize that a reputation, character evidence is important in a criminal case. Finally, and I'm almost done, don't clap. Uh, <laughs> we, have <clears throat> we have Kim Potter. She testified. You saw her. I don't believe, and rely on your notes, I wrote it down somewhere here that they claim she admitted something. I contest that. Look at your notes. Kim Potter took the stand, and she said she saw Johnson, that she saw him, and he had a look on his face she'd never seen before. And that was right before she said, taser, taser. Now, they want to argue the body -worn, that the body-worn camera, if we run it real, real slow, you can't see that. Well, of course you can. The body-worn camera is here. It's on the body. Her head's up here, even though she's 5'3". She can still see in the car. That's an outrageous argument. It makes no sense at all. They're relying on the slow motion of a body-worn camera, not the fast speed. If you saw it in fast speed, it's chaos. And then she tells you a 
about why she became a police officer. She became a police officer because when she is grade school, a police officer, she knows his name, Mike McGee, came to school and told him, talked about bicycles. She went, decided that day to be a police officer. She was a school officer letting elementary kids walk across the street when she was in junior high. <clears throat> she was an explorer in high school, came, continued to be an explorer, went to college at St. Mary's, took law enforcement and sociology, and worked, took the training, first worked at the Anoka State Hospital, then she got a job in Brooklyn Center. And she worked there for 26 years, ladies and gentlemen, 26 years in which she volunteered for domestic, helped the victims in domestics, going to the death of officers and handling that, crisis intervention, all of these things she did, and there's other ones I'm not going to, that she was very interested in helping people. And that's a sign of good character. Does that tell you that she did not know she had a gun? Of course it does. Does that tell you that she used reasonable force, deadly force, because she saw Johnson? She didn't know she had a gun, but she did shoot her taser. And by the way, there is an instruction in here about using the taser. <clears throat> and the reason that's there is because I believe Stoughton said that, oh, she couldn't even use non-deadly force. It doesn't find her not guilty, the non-deadly force. The judge will tell you that in the instructions. But it will also tell you about non-deadly force. And Stoughton, he would say, no, you can't use non-deadly force. You can't use a taser. You have to just let him go. Does that make sense, ladies and gentlemen? So that's why that's there, because Stoughton said that. You decide the credibility of Stoughton. That's it. I'm done, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I probably will sit down and remember 10 other things I should have said, but um, I'm finished. Um, the Potter family thanks you for listening to this case. It's, very, it's a very uh, emotional case, but you have to look at the law and the evidence, the evidence about did she have a right to use deadly force? Of course she did. Whether she knew it or not, all those officers said that. She didn't know she had a gun, so how could she consciously, recklessly handle one? And more, above all, in the first one, causation. Everything they were doing as good police officers until Dante Wright took it upon himself to flee. He even left after he was shot, purposely. So on behalf of my client and her family, Mr. Ng and myself, and Amanda Montgomery, the brains behind the operation. We thank you for your careful attention in this case. And if you look at the evidence, the believable evidence, and follow the judge's instructions, it's not a difficult case. They failed in every element, miserably failed. And I hope that you come to the fair conclusion of not guilty based on the evidence. Kim Potter isn't guilty of these crimes. Thank you. There's Earl Gray. Let's take a break. Matt Frank's next. He'll get the final word. Be right back.